just finished your uh, your master's. Well, a couple of years ago, a year ago, you finished your master's, and you're yes, now working. Yeah. yeah, and you're now working on your PhD. So, how is aging taught in university? Is it taught? I mean, did, did you cover it in your master's? And, and- yeah. So I did. Uh- biochemistry is my undergrad degree so in my third year so it was a three-year course for my undergrads in my third year we got set um in biochemistry it's kind of like a kind of cliche uh, essay title which is called science and society which is like we learn about all these you know proteins and how they interact with each other and different techniques in the lab but we now need to know our knowledge to like the real world situation in terms of treating diseases and so they set different questions um that's basically try to make us use our bio, biochemical knowledge and apply it to like the real world. And so we got set this essay and one of the questions that was set was, um, can we extend human lifespan? If so, what are the ethical implications and how would we achieve this? And I think, you know, I did so much reading when I got set that, that question. And it, so initially it was a lot of like personal um, investigation around the topic. So reading a lot of review articles, I guess like the hallmarks of aging was uh, a kind of a key starting point for me. Um, and so that was like a tiny part of my third year. It wasn't until my master's year where we actually had some lectures, I think about three or four lectures about aging, um, where again, we were introduced to, to like the hallmarks of aging and effectively we were taught it about, yeah, we were taught it by by using the hallmarks. So firstly, we talked about DNA mutations, then we looked at epigenetic changes, uh, protein misfolding, and basically for each of those sections, we learned about the evidence for it. Um, and basically to be able to, to prove that something is associated with aging, you need evidence that if you increase uh, the process, to so increase the number of damage um, in mutations or protein misfolding, you advance aging, but also evidence in the opposite direction, that if you can reduce the number of mutations, um, reduce misfolding, you can also decrease age, uh, aging. So, I mean, yeah, we cover all sorts of topics in biochemistry, but we did have an introduction uh, to it. Having like done biochemistry, is there many is is there many opportunities in for like PhD studies related to aging or any kind of career path afterwards? I'm just Trying to, I'm just interested to see because we talk to like um, some people who do investment. Uh, that they, they say, you know, investing in cancer. There's lots of money in cancer, right? But almost nothing in aging. So is that still the way that you kind of see it? Yeah. So I mean, definitely. If I throw myself back to like two or three years ago when I was applying for PhDs. So I'm now at the Cancer Research UK mm-hmm. here in, in uh, Cambridge, um, studying cellular senescence, but kind of from the cancer perspective. And partly because after, you know, in my master's year, I got interested in this crazy phenomenon of aging um, and wanted to do a PhD in this area. But there wasn't many, um, at least in the UK, there wasn't many PhD projects in labs that were specifically focused on aging. There were either like labs looking at neurodegeneration and maybe like aging as well, or like cancer and maybe a bit of aging. So, yeah, I think definitely a while ago, yes. Um, I think things maybe have been different in the States for longer because you have like the Buck Institute. I know for a while we've had like aging as a more of a major focus. And to be honest, even in the UK, the Babraham Institute, which is, um, you might have heard of Paul Freich, who's currently based there, um, who's uh, now joining Elsos Labs, but they also had a bit of a shift in their focus more towards aging in the last couple of years. So I definitely think if I was applying for a PhD today, there would be way more labs that are more geared directly to aging. Plus, there's also now, I guess, lots of different startups and companies in the space as well. And they're also looking for like research scientists. Uh, yeah, so there's opportunities if you wanted to not stay in academia, but to go elsewhere to do further research. And then there's initiatives that I've also taken part in, such as On Deck Longevity Biotech. Well, I think I think I could have said it wrong, but um, <laughs> there's communities now of people who are also share similar interests and also looking for different career opportunities in the aging space. And so I think due to this, um, like even within like the last two years, this growing interest in the field, there's now a lot more opportunities for young scientists wanting to, to get into the area. Are you planning to, do you have your plans for after PhD? Are you planning to stay in the aging field? Um, do I have my plans? Um, I have <laughs> ideas. I yeah. definitely like doing research. I think um I liked in science communication as well. And I think inevitably I'll probably 
try and find a way to do both at the same time even when I graduate um so I, yeah I should graduate the end of or like September 2023 so mm. I'm yeah I'm in my third year at the moment of my mm. PhD so I have like another year and a half to go and then um I mean I'd like to leave the UK and get some experience in a, a lab abroad I'm mm. currently thinking probably the states um because mm. there's so many like really awesome research labs there but I think it um I like doing the science communication, but I often find having, being a researcher and like being aware of the experimental techniques and also doing experiments myself, it provides like a, a different perspective on like reading papers. You you get to network more of different scientists and you, you understand the techniques that they're trying to do. And you also know like the realistic um, expectations of what it's like to do an experiment, how to conduct an experiment, um, how long certain things can take. And I think, yeah, I also just like being the first one to ask a question and to see the data come through. I think there's something special about that. So yeah, my, my options are pretty open-ended, but something that enables me to still do science communication, but also do some research myself. What I would like to ask in the last few minutes, so where do you hope, so, so you, your channel is, is growing, it, it's very good. So where do you hope to take your channel? Where, you know, what, what's your next phase for... The Shiki Science Science Show. <laughs> um, so actually, this week I did my first uh, in-person interview. So um, it should probably come out today. Actually, um, I finally it was something I've been wanting to do for ages, but then COVID kind of halted it quite a bit. So one thing I want to do is just kind of like normalize the science process, or maybe normalize isn't the right word. Just like kind of make it more transparent and more accessible to people who are interested in it. Um, and so that would mean physically going to, to researchers and just asking them what it is, what it's like to be a researcher, what is it is they do on a day-to-day -day basis and what it's like inside different companies or different research labs. Because I think back to when I was younger thinking about like career options and I never even really realized that being a scientist was a thing. You know, if you told me about scientists when I was younger, I'd assume it'd be, okay, I'll become a teacher or I'll be like David Attenborough, I'll be some kind of like TV presenter. I didn't, you know, really think about what it's like to, to be a scientist in a lab doing experiments, the value that you get from being a researcher. And so my aim is to try and do more in-person stuff. Obviously, I still want to do the, the summary papers and the animations because... I just frankly like doing that as well. Um, and I, I guess I kind of alluded to already that I'd like to probably move out of the UK um, uh, after my PhD. And I'm also hoping to travel to the States this year. So potentially there could be some in-person content when I go there. We'll see. Um, but yeah, definitely. I just want to educate the people on the latest science um, and kind of also I mean, I try to make sure people can understand it, but I know I also put in too much detail at times, but I think I don't want to, you know, I think people are smarter than they think they are. And I'm sure that, that it's, I'd always rather put in more detail than less because then people can do their own further reading and their own time if they're curious and make their own opinions on the research. So I'm just trying to help, you know, bridge that gap between scientific papers and news articles. Um, <laughs> And hopefully it helps people um, and they find it both educational, but for me as well, entertainment is also quite important. So if, that, if I achieve both those things, then yeah, then I'm happy. <laughs> I I certainly see both of them. You know, it's it's important to get the message out because but almost everyone believes like frailty is inevitable, right? And and that the, the aging is the way it is, you know, but, but I think there is a choice and, People need to understand that, and it's really good to try and explain that. And I think you're doing a great job there. And like in-person interviews would be excellent. So, where do you go for your source of aging news? Oh, good question. So, I'd actually say um, Twitter is surprisingly good. I would advocate that for any researcher. Um, it's just you know because a lot of scientists are on Twitter these days um, and mostly use it. For like their scientific social network so I mean I use like personal social media but Twitter I try to keep like more purely like academic and so because a lot of labs are there on Twitter now if they publish a new paper they're more likely to to publish it there first and they also um tend to also in a couple of tweets break down the key points of the paper um and so without having to read the paper I could click on it and see okay they talk about this that and 
uh, this feature. Do I want to read it or not? Uh, yes or no kind of thing. And so I, I find that's a really good way of finding papers. Also different journals, you can subscribe to like newsletters. And like I've like once a week or once a month, they'll um, send through emails where they highlight the latest research articles. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, if you saw, could see my web browser right now, you would see like hundreds of tabs of all the different papers I'm trying to read, but I just never get around to. Um, which is, I guess, you know, I tried to summarize papers and I think the more people who did similar things, it just, it'd be a really good way to to absorb more content because it's really hard these days as a scientist to, to A, be doing the research, be planning experiments, but at the same time trying to read papers to help support or validate your experiments. And it's, it's intense. And I think, yeah, finding better ways to communicate science and to improve the efficiency um, so that we don't end up reproducing results that have already been done um, or like or doing experiments that have already been pro proven to be false, etc. Okay, so uh, where can people go to follow your work? And yeah, I so use Twitter as well. And then, yeah, the YouTube channel is probably the best place. So you tweet, do you tweet when you put anything on the channel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, you're, you're, so we'll put your Twitter and your channel in the, in the description so people can follow you. Great, thank you. Okay, so... I don't know. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was that was really interesting. Uh, no, thank you for having me. You actually you asked some really interesting questions that really made me think. And so I think we had quite a stimulating conversation. Thank you. It was it was great chatting to you. Yeah, really enjoyed that.